Welcome to Playground Books, essays revisiting the stories I first read as a kid and loved enough to spend my recesses reading. This book is not hard to describe. It's baby's first existential crisis about immortality. Said and done, I could leave you there. But that's not entirely fair to Natalie Babbitt and her carefully considered little novel, so let's see if we can do better. Tuck Everlasting is about time. It's about what happens when you realize you have a life to live and have to decide what you want to do with it, what you want it to be, what you want to be, and to a lesser but still important sense, what you want the world to be, which may or may not be what it is. It's about the adoration of entropy and despairing at the instinct to be short-sighted and greedy and so, so horrifically insensitive that you're willing to demolish all within your reach in exchange for an advertisement full of lies, when you're either buying into or profiting off of. It's 1880, America, and lights go up on a little town called Tree Gap, neighbored by a wood that hardly anyone ever trespasses into. This is because it, and the tidy, proper little cottage on its edge, are owned by the Fosters, a stiff-shirted and overprotective family, the kind more likely to wrinkle their foreheads and noses than learn something new. The ten-year-old daughter of this family, Winnie Foster, is our point-of-view character for the novel, who spends much of her day whiling away time in the yard of their cottage with its high iron fence, staring out at the wood and the road and life passing her by. In case you couldn't tell, this is a metaphor. This whole book is packed with metaphors and symbolism. That's why it's so often assigned in middle school English classes, which is where I was first made to read it, and watch the movie adaptation, but there's less that's interesting to discuss in that. This idea of time and captivity is brought up early in the book, both with the visual of Winnie in a cage in the yard, and really as soon as the first opening lines before that. Quote, the road that led to Tree Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cows who were, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles, swayed off and up in a pleasant tangent to the top of a small hill, ambled down again between fringes of bee-hung clover, and then cut sideways across a meadow. I've been in enough writing classes to have been impressed with the importance of the first lines of a book. You're to hook your reader, introduce your themes somehow snag enough attention or beauty or action to get the witless eyes that have landed on your first page to keep reading. In short stories, I've been instructed, you need to know what the story is about by the end of the first page. Take Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find as an example. The story opens with a family planning on taking a trip down south, and the grandmother makes an offhand comment, a warning trying to get them to reconsider, about an escaped convict called the Misfit. If you're paying attention, you know where this is headed. You know this family is going to run into the misfit before this story is up. In Tuck Everlasting, the first detail we get is the setting, the town of Tree Gap and what it hides, and we get the beginnings of this meditation on time and moving through it. In the description of the way the cows ambled along, we are imbued with the combination of progress, yes, but slow progress. There isn't a breakneck pace being set here, but neither is there stagnation. Come along, it says. See the hills and the clover and the meadow and the wood. And then the next sentence. Here its edges blurred. It widened and seemed to pause, suggesting tranquil bovine picnics, slow chewing, and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite. Flannery would be proud. A handful of sentences in, and if you're paying attention, you know where this is headed. In her caged yard, Winnie is passed by by those on the road, including a man in a yellow suit and a toad whom she makes friends with, which is about as much as you need to know about Please Stockholm Syndrome me Winnie Foster, eager to find something, someone, that is hers. Inspired by the toad and its freedom, Winnie decides to sneak out and go exploring in the woods that her family owns. There she meets a boy drinking from a spring in the middle of the woods. He looks about seventeen. Spoiler, he isn't. This is Jesse Tuck, soon joined by his brother Miles and his mother, May, and they panic that Winnie has seen the location of this strange spring, and then kind of kidnap her. 
On the journey to their home, they explained that they passed through the area eighty-seven years before and drank from the spring, and soon after discovered that it had made them immortal. Their horse was accidentally shot and didn't show a scratch. Jesse fell from a tree onto his neck and walked away fine, and only their cat, who did not drink the water, was aging. After that, we went sort of crazy, said Jesse, grinning at the memory. Heck, we was going to live forever. Can you picture what it felt like to find that out? Much of the rest of the book is composed of Winnie's conversations with different members of the Tuck family on their respective merits and downfalls of immortality. Because this quote from Jesse is the crux of it. Can you really picture what it would feel like to learn you weren't going to die? That you were never going to die? Immortality is rampant in literature, a given assumption in so much mythology, and especially for the target audience of this book, kids around Winnie's age, it's treated almost blindly like a good thing. But here, it's vital for Winnie to grasp the consequences, to picture the impossible and learn justified fear. The older son, Miles, had gotten married and had children before they realized they couldn't die, but his wife left him, believing he made a deal with the devil. May and Tuck, who's the father of the family, made a home on the far side of the spring's woods so they could keep an eye on it and the boys travel and work odd jobs, but they return every ten years to see each other, which brings us up to now. When they arrive at the Tuck's home, the narration settles in for a long description, again, like in the opening, reflective of the larger themes of the book. She was unprepared for the homely little house beside the pond, unprepared for the gentle eddies of dust, the silver cobwebs, the mouse who lived, and welcome to him in a table drawer for there was everywhere evidence of their activities, maize and tucks. Her sewing, patches and scraps of bright cloth, half-completed quilts and braided rugs, a bag of cotton batting with wisps of its contents like snow, drifting into cracks and corners, the arms of the sofa webbed with strands of thread and dangerous with needles, his wood carving, curly shavings furring the floor and little heaps of splinters and chips, every surface dim with the sawdust of countless sandings, limbs of unassembled dolls and wooden soldiers, a ship model propped on the mouse's table waiting for its glue to dry, and a stack of wooden bowls, their sides smooth to velvet, the topmost bowl filled with a jumble of big wooden spoons and forks like dry bleached bones. We make things to sell, said May, surveying the mess approvingly. This passage, and so much else in this book, is full of the absolute adoration of entropy. Entropy is chaos. It's a measure of disorder in the universe. And the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, entropy cannot decrease. The chaos, the disorder, the jumbling around of energy in the universe is always increasing, and in billions and billions of years, all energy will be evenly distributed so that everything everywhere is the same nebulous mess, and that's what's called the heat death of the universe. Castles cannot stand forever, they will fall to rubble. Living things cannot go on forever, they will decay. Entropy is the ticking clock on existence, which of course means it's easy to paint it in the worst light, to cast it as the villain in all our plays. But in truth, the second law of thermodynamics, the continuous increase of entropy, is also the reason life exists. If there were no entropy, there would be no change, no growth, no death, but also no real life. The Tucks themselves have stepped outside of entropy, but we can see through their house, in the chaos and mess of belongings and knickknacks and the detritus of a thousand hobbies, the influence of entropy still. Chaos is a side effect of creation, and it's a thing to revel in. Winnie compares it with her tiny, uninterested and uninteresting home, always scrubbed and dusted and clean, but as we see with this story, nothing happens there. The action of real life being lived, of things being made to sell, unavoidably creates chaos, pushing along the clock of the universe. We are unassembled and jumbled and webbed and propped and surveyed in the Tuck's house, and how amazing is that? Here also are the beginnings of the discussion about what you do with life, and what you fill your life up with. In this list, we see how May and Tuck are choosing to spend their days pursuing so many little endeavors that have no less meaning or significance for being ordinary. Each member of the Tuck family has a different outlook on the immortality they've been granted. May's perhaps can be described as the most accepting. She is happy. 
fulfilled with these activities, the mundane elements that make up a small life. She loves her family and seems to have taken the perspective that, seeing as their situation cannot be changed, she has set out to make the best. It provides grounding for Winnie as she comes to understand the conundrum of the spring, but it's maybe more comforting than it ought to be. In contrast, we have Tuck. He and Winnie go out on the pond for a conversation, where he tries to impress upon her the importance of keeping the spring a secret, imagining the horror if it were to be discovered. How many people would die to live forever? Talking to Tuck, you can hear the anguish of immortality. He says, But dying's a part of the wheel, right there next to being born. You can't pick out the pieces you like and leave the rest. Being part of the whole thing, that's the blessing. But it's passing us by, us talks. Living's heavy work, but off to one side, the way we are, it's useless, too. It don't make sense. If I know how to climb back on the wheel, I'd do it in a minute. You can't have living without dying, so you can't call it living what we've got. We just are. We just be. Like rocks beside the road. Tuck's voice was rough now, and Winnie, amazed, sat rigid. No one had ever talked to her of things like this before. I want to grow again, he said fiercely, and change. And if that means I got to move on at the end of it, then I want that too. Tuck is constantly afraid of the spring being discovered and of his family being found out, and there is no end in sight for him. He's affected by the reality of immortality more than the rest of the family, maybe because he's the oldest. None of them have seemed to mature past the ages they were when they drank the water, despite the passing decades, which is evident nowhere more strongly than in Jesse, the youngest son, whom Winnie met first. Jesse is a 17-year-old who never grew up, literally. He's cavalier and reckless and still kind of thrilled by the fun of not being able to die. He almost doesn't understand his parents' reticence and wish to stay hidden. He's excited to travel the world, have adventures. That evening after the family has dinner, he gives Winnie a vial of the water from the spring and invites that she wait until she's also seventeen and then drink it, and the two of them could go off on adventures together, which is really a fantastically terrible idea. The uniquely bad kind that sounds like it's granting every wish you could have in the world as a teenager. In the movie adaptation, they actually age Winnie up so the two of them can be love interests, which even in fourth grade I knew was some BS. Meanwhile, Winnie's family is understandably a little distressed that their daughter has been kidnapped, but along comes the man in the yellow suit, whom Winnie saw on the road at the beginning of the novel. He also passed by her when she was being taken away by the tux, and now he's come back to the Fosters, with the proposition that he will lead them to the people who took their daughter, as long as they agree to sell him their woods, which contains, though they don't know it, the magical spring. It turns out that the man's parents knew Miles' wife and children, so he's long heard rumors about a strange family who never aged, and he's determined to come and find the spring and sell off drinks of the water to those who are good enough for it, or eat rich enough for it. After duping the Fosters, he and the sheriff get on their way to the Tuck's house. So Winnie's heard the perspectives of May, Tuck, and Jesse. Next up is Miles. In truth, I think he has the saddest story, and his characterization has a heaviness to it that contrasts with his younger brother. Miles was in his early 20s when he stopped aging and truly lost his family when his wife and kids left him. Beyond the existential fears and the defiance of thermodynamics and worries about how long eternity truly is, this is the deepest downside of immortality. What happens when you're immortal but your loved ones aren't? Because he's a little older than Jesse, he has a more mature view. He and Winnie go fishing for breakfast and have the following exchange. What will you do if you've got so much time? Someday, said Miles, I'll find a way to do something important. But what will you do? Winnie persisted. I don't know yet. I'll find a way, though. I'll locate something. This is the larger question of the novel, or at least the one that I glom onto in this reread. I'm past the allure and debate of wanting to live forever, if I was ever preoccupied with it at all. But as Winnie says, what will you do? And that question is still enough to send me into a tailspin. These are the four approaches to life and immortality in Tuck Everlasting. 
displayed through morose and earnest tuck, slow but determined miles, cocky and flighty Jessie, and peaceful and hopeful May. Winnie is the audience surrogate, a blank slate for the reader to project onto. She doesn't even say much in the dialogue. Each conversation really then becomes a direct appeal to the reader, trying to convince them, while the Tucks are trying to convince Winnie, to sit and actually think about this big idea and all the weight and implications therein. I've got to finish up the plot for you now. So the man in the yellow suit shows up and exposits all his evil plans for an evil world where only the rich live forever, and threatens to use the Tucks as guinea pigs to demonstrate the water's effects and, if they won't cooperate, to use Winnie instead, and May hits him in the head with a shotgun right as the sheriff rolls up. She gets arrested, and when the man dies from his injury, is sentenced to death, which is a problem for obvious reasons. Winnie is returned to her family, but she sees this as her opportunity to do something big and important like she and Miles were talking about. They come up with a plan to break May out of the county jail and have Winnie take her place in the cell so the sheriff won't notice until they've gotten away. They pull it off, and then they're gone. There's a hollow sort of moment when Winnie is in the cell, looking up at the bars they prop back against the window, wondering if they're going to peek through one last time and say goodbye. But what does a goodbye mean to a bunch of immortals? Later on at the end of that summer, Winnie again sees the toad from earlier in the novel getting chased by a dog, and she pours the water Jessie gave her over it to protect it forever. She tells herself she can always go and get more when she grows up. But in truth, I think the reader knows her decision is made there. In the final chapter, a sort of epilogue, May and Tuck come back to Tree Gap 70 years later. The town's been built up, the woods paved over by concrete, the spring buried, unfound. Tuck goes to the town cemetery, and he finds Winnie's grave, that reads, Dear Wife, Dear Mother, implying her long and happy life. He says, Good girl, even though there's a deep sadness to it. A deep and forever loneliness that comes when you help someone avoid the fate you are trapped in, which of course means you're still in it alone. It took me a while to write this episode, which I maybe should have seen coming before picking Tuck Everlasting, but I don't really care about immortality. Those who do, is it fear driving them? Is it desire to see the legacy you are in the process of leaving? Or is it just knowledge that the world is a big place, and there will never be enough time to see and do and be? But that's the trouble, I think. Because there is no immortality that will ever give you enough time. There is always more being changed and created all around you, and with that goal of crossing everything off an infinite list, you're only becoming the rock which the river beats against. At what point does it become too much, too much, too much? Or perhaps worse, all the same, the heat death of the universe. I have no interest in life forever in this world. And to be honest, I'm skeptical of anyone who does. Even the wish to do something important, something, at some point, becomes like the billionaire pledging to give away their fortune. Soon. Yeah. Once they've saved enough. Once it's worthwhile. Once they've decided. In that way, maybe Winnie's path is the best. Deciding what small and specific task will be her contribution. Deciding before there's a chance to back out. And then moving on toward her happy death fulfilled, rather than tempted, to continue seeking for eternity. I like Tuck Everlasting, and it did stick with me, because it's aware of the questions it's asking. As I said at the start, there is no wondering what this book is about. In The Dilemma of Immortality, we are forced to consider our wishes, our fears, and our ways of filling up a life. Jessie asks Winnie to picture what she would do if she found out she would live forever. But really, what we do when we find out that we will not is so much more vital. Thanks for listening. The music is by David Hillowitz. The book is by Natalie Babbitt. The opinions are by me. For the next episode, I'll be rereading The Secrets of Droon by Tony Abbott. Talk to you then. Thank you.